Welcome to day 101 as we break right through the century mark and shaped by the word. It has uh, been a nice adventure so far. We started with the Gospel of Luke and did early church history, uh, you know, throughout the book of Acts. And, of course, part of the first missionary journey was uh, Paul's venture into the southern portion of Galatia, Lystra, Derby, Iconium, city and Antioch. And, and these are the cities that he's written this letter to. And uh, he has shared with him a gospel that is uh, the law has pointed to and the law has set us up for, but is deeply centered in Christ, who is a fulfillment of the law. And uh, he's made an argument uh, that the promise came well before you know the law came, and the promise was that God would bless all the nations of the earth through Abraham. And he talks about uh, Abraham's seed, and he uses a you know a singular. He said, "There's one particular seed that makes all the difference in the world. It's not the many physical descendants, but it is the one physical descendant, Jesus, who all, because of faith in Him, become the seed or become the children mm-hmm. of Abraham." So he continues the argument on what it means for us to be a, a child of promise or a child of Abraham, our people who are included through Christ in Abraham's uh, covenant. So let's uh, take off and read Galatians chapter 4. Uh, before we do that, Matt, why don't you, um, why don't you lift us up in prayer? Yeah. Father, we, uh, we come to you uh, asking for you to, to be with us, to give us wisdom as we read your word. We thank you for the reminder um, from James that, that when we draw near to you, you draw near to us. And so as we read your word together, uh, would you do exactly that? Would you draw near to us uh, fill us with wisdom, transform us into the image of Christ. Um, God, encourage us and comfort us. Convict us of the areas we need conviction. And Father, um, most of all, would you um, would you cause Jesus to 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 be magnified um, in this time together? Uh, God, would you get glory um, through us? Thank you for um, this time. God, work among us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Mm-hmm. I'm going to take you back just a paragraph or two into chapter 3 uh, as we read through chapter 4. So I'm going to start in chapter 3, verse 23, and just get the flavor or the intensity of Paul's argument. It's a really important argument for understanding Paul, for understanding the gospel, and for understanding grace. Before the coming of this faith, he says in uh, Galatians 3, verse 23, before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So in Christ Jesus, you're all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. There is, uh, nor is there male and female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What I'm saying is that as long as an heir, and here we are in chapter 4 for today's reading, what I'm saying is that as long as an heir is underage, he's no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were underage, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you were his sons, God sent his spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you were his child, God made you also an heir. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who were nature, not God's. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you're turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You're observing special days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that somehow I've wasted my efforts on you. I plead with you, brothers and sisters, to become like me before I came like you. You did me no wrong. As you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. And even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus himself. Where then is your blessing of me now? I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? Those people are zealous to win you over, but for no good. 
what they want is to alienate you from us that you may have zeal for them. It's fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good, and to be so always, not just when I'm with you. My dear children, for whom I'm again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, how I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I'm perplexed about you. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. A son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but a son by the free woman was born as a result of a divine promise. These things are being taken figuratively. Women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now Hagar stands for Mount Sinai and Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Be glad, barren woman. You who never bore a child shout for joy and cry aloud, for you are never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Now you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. That time the son born to the flesh persecuted the son born by the power of the Spirit. It is the same now. But what does Scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. <clears throat> what a daring illustration uh, where Paul turns everything that his uh, Jewish challengers would have uh, presented on its head and, and give just the, exactly the opposite interpretation of how most people would have looked at it. They, they would have seen Hagar as representing Gentiles who mm -hmm. were, were slaves, and they would have, I mean, uh, uh, representing Gentiles who were slaves, and of course Isaac representing the Jewish people, but he, he reverses it. Mm -hmm. Those of us who have come by faith in Christ are children of promise. And, and those who are still bound under the law after it has been fulfilled in Christ and set aside by the work of Christ on the cross, find themselves in a slavery, not only to the law, but to the elemental and the principles or forces, you know, of this world. I love how, he, how we open this too. I mean, is there a greater privilege in the gospel than being called children of God? And not just called children of God, but living in the reality, objective reality that we now are children of God. I, mean, I love that image because it, it would have been one thing, I think, for God to just save us from our sins you know, and, and kind of leave it at that. You know, but, but he's gone so much further that he mm -hmm. has redeemed us from our sins. He's, you know, he's justified us, you know, reconciled, like all these things. But then he even says, now you're a part of my family. And he, he invites us into this intimacy that, you know, along with the Spirit, we can cry out the Father. I mean, what, what a what a great gift, you know, that, that was not definitely not ours, and, and something we could earn. You know, I'm not sure that you know it was even you know if even the Jews, Jewish people realized the promise of God, how rich that relationship would come, you know, through the Holy Spirit. But it is absolutely amazing that it, it extends, you know, past them or through them. Yeah. Uh, you know, it is a, a fulfillment of who they are and a fulfillment of their purpose that. You know, grace is extended, you know, to the Gentiles, to the Gentiles. And so those of us who are far away, uh, as Paul will say in Ephesians, have been brought near, you know, through the blood of Christ. And that is from being alienated from God into the very presence or the holy place of God with all of the privileges. And, and not only privileges, but what he's emphasizing here and will, uh, of course, emphasize in a big way as we roll into chapter 5 is the freedom yeah. mm -hmm. and the joy that we have you know, being liberated, you know, from bondage and slavery. That's a definite theme that it's in this chapter and all throughout Galatians is just that freedom aspect, freedom versus the, in the slavery or um, being enslaved to um, sin, which can look very different. Um, it sounds like to them they're, what they were dealing with is being enslaved to the traditions um, that they have been freed from in Christ, right? Um, the Jewish tradition. So, um, but yeah, I think I was kind of reading through this and thinking through it this morning and just um, what the the relationship difference would be coming to um, belief and, and faith in Christ. I mean, your relationship to God is so different and you've been given, I was just kind of thinking through like all the, um, the, the changes and really you're given access as a child um, 
uh, you're given s- just um, just the relation, the maybe like the intimacy, the personal relationship with him um, brought through through Jesus, and and really made a son as Jesus is, and so you inherit as well what he inherits. Right. But mm-hmm. I just kind of thinking through that, man. It's, so many huge things and, and not just a son but uh figuratively speaking a spoiled spoiled rich kid yeah <laughs> uh, because he uses he said you know uh, the son you know before he is actually brought into his inheritance you know is treated to, uh, he's under the supervision of slaves and is no different than a slave himself which of course is a picture of the old covenant you know which paul has already told us was our guardian to bring us to christ or even to bind us up under sin to help us to realize our sin and realize the depth of our bondage, uh, but in Christ we have become an heir with Him. There is, you know, neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, but all are in, are in Christ, and in Christ uh, we have become heirs, and we have inherited all the riches of God through Christ Jesus. Plus, this wonderful freedom, and you have two big Old Testament images, you know, coming together: the Exodus, where you know the people of God were. Uh, delivered from bondage as slaves you know to the nation of egypt and of course the exile where they were carried away to serve another nation and in both instances god miraculously brings them back to be the people of god and both the exodus and the exile become the type for the freedom that we have to finally receive the promise of god Mm -hmm. and uh, and we know well what it's like to be enslaved to uh, the things that that bind us i mean mm -hmm. Um, it might for us not necessarily look the exact same way that it looked for them, but I know for me, I mean, enslaved to um, this idea that that I need to be liked, I need to, people's approval, and so really, Galatians is huge for me because it's this constant reminder that I'm I am not working for the approval of man. I'm I long for the approval of my my heavenly Father and. And I have that in Christ, you know. In, in Galatians, Paul set up a you know definitive break. We have a definitive break from the flesh. We are no longer in the flesh, but we are, are in the Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. But those of us in the Spirit, Paul seems to be hinting at all the way through the book, you know, or even more more strongly than just hinting at, we can live as if we were still people in bondage, or live, you know, still if we were people under the flesh. And he's asking them, why do you want to return to those yeah. things that once you held you and once mm-hmm. bound you and once rendered you, you know, fearful and weak and uh, disabled you and robbed you of your joy, even though they may have been attractive to us at first, like the approval of people, mm-hmm. you know, uh, can, can yeah. seem, yeah, that would be pretty cool if people liked me. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but in the end, it's a slavery. And to that, our slavery to our wealth, to our materialism, to our image, mm-hmm. you know, all of these things that, that we are freed from, you know, in Christ. You know, and Jesus. So what a great question. Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? Of course, Matt, uh, one of the things I like is the nice little correction Paul you know, gives himself. He says, now that you're known by God, wait, wait, yeah. now that you know yeah. God, wait, wait a minute, now that you are known by yeah. God, in case you think you somehow found God, we want to remind you that uh, the true seeker, you know, was not you seeking God. The true seeker was God seeking you, and he found you, and he knows you, and he has brought you in, into sonship, delivering you from these weak and miserable things that you formerly gave yourself to. And yeah. once you gave yourself to them, we're completely enslaved by. Mm. Yeah, and I love, I love Paul's pastoral heart. You know, he gets to kind of to the end of mm-hmm. that little section before he goes on to the Hagar and Sarah story, but he says, My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. And, and just the contrast with that, that Paul's saying, my deepest longing for you is that Christ would be formed in you. And, you know, and I'm in the pains of childbirth. I've never heard a guy say that. but um, <laughs> He doesn't really know what that feels yeah. like. But. but he's contrasting it with, you know, these people are zealous to win you over but for no good, for their own gain. Mm-hmm. I'm zealous to see you formed into the image of Christ. And I love that. I mean, that that is a pastoral heart. And, and I think that's even just speaking of our team, like that's what I long to see for our people is, and for myself, is that we would be formed, you know, Christ would be formed in us. Mm-hmm. And, and kind of going back to even what you were talking about previously, I, I, one of the things I love about Paul too is just how he reminds them, you know, that you are united, you know, with Christ. 
but your communion with Christ is deeply affected by you know these things as well. And I, and I think sometimes one of the things that that we think is just because we've we've received Christ as our Savior, you know, then communion will just automatically happen. And, and we forget that there is so many things that are, you know, competing for our attention and our affection and so many things, you know, false teaching that, that is simply robbing us of our communion and at stake is our is our union, you know, in a sense, mm-hmm. or perceived union. No, I love that. Mm-hmm. It, it's not, you know, I'm in childbirth, you know, the pains of childbirth. It's once again, mm-hmm. you know, when I came to the city, I just, I, I, I wanted you to know Christ. It hurt so bad that it hurt deeply. And now that I see you drifting away from Christ, that hurts even even more. And you're, you know, you're you're making me, you know, go through those pangs, you know, one more time. And, and we ought to touch a little bit on, you know, on the uh, the analogy of you know Hagar and Sarah. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is uh, again uh, Abraham and Sarah panicked because they'd been promised a son, but they hadn't seen that promise fulfilled, and they took it on their own to fulfill the promise. You know, through a, through a concubine or through a slave girl or through a surrogate and a mother and, and, and of course, you know, through that uh, uh, son was born that was, you know, very much Ishmael who would be, very much be a thorn in, in their side mm-hmm. uh, and finally would have to be dismissed. And then, of course, through the promise, finally Isaac was born and Isaac was the hope, mm-hmm. you know, of the people of Israel. And when they talked about their fathers, it'd be Abraham, you know, Isaac. In Jacob, yeah. and uh, but uh, he, he reverses it. He said the promise is, is extended to those who have come through the one seed through Christ, uh, the seed of Abraham, the ultimate seed of Abraham, and of course the ultimate seed of the woman who would crush the serpent. Mm-hmm. And the seed the emphasis goes all the way back is the Lord Jesus Christ, and through Him we all become seed and, and heirs of the promise. But this reversal was stunning. Mm-hmm. You know what he's doing with the Old Testament text, applying the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to those who come by faith in Christ, and uh, slavery for those who remain yeah. uh, under the law. Well, and this likely would have been one of those main passages the Judaizers was you could have been pointing to, saying, it, you know, if if you're a Gentile wants to become like one of us, here's evidence. You know, the promises are reserved for this line. Mm-hmm. And they're Gentiles, so they need to participate. There is no doubt that they would have interpreted this passage much different. Yeah. You know, in order to become children of the promise, you must embrace the, you know, the sign of the covenant and, and take on the law of the covenant. And of course, that's exactly uh, what they were, were teaching. Mm-hmm. And he just finds with, ends with, you know, this, this final say, brothers and sisters, we're not children of slave women, but of free women, and therefore we to are, are free in Christ just yeah. sneak ahead and it is for freedom that Christ has set us free <laughs> yeah. stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again with the yoke of slavery mm-hmm. Katie you mind closing us with the word prayer Father what a gift this freedom is that, that we have been given in Christ and so would you continue to show us more and more what that even looks like um as we live these lives that you've given us what it looks like to live in the freedom of christ and doesn't mean that we can do what we want in fact when we just do what we want um, with no regard to you and your will um, that is actually the opposite of freedom it's just more um, more bondage and so would you help us um, to to continue to come back to your word to continue to um, ask your spirit to to show us um, what it means to live in the freedom that we've been given. Um, Thank you. Thank you for breaking these um, chains. And and thank you so much for the hope that we have um, in the gospel. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.